Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to today's webcast. My name is Zena M. Pagan, ARF's Marketing Manager, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we begin learning about the consumer's journey across the omni-channel universe, I'll go over some house rules. We are aiming to provide the best webcast experience possible. You can help us execute this by keeping yourself muted and keeping your computer web cameras turned off. Unfortunately, if you do turn on your cameras or unmute yourselves, I will have to disconnect your access to today's webcast. The audio will be streamed. This means that you will be able to hear us throughout your computer speakers. However, if you prefer to use a teleconference option, please see the information on your screen. Additionally, I will post the information on the chat box throughout the webcast. Should you have any questions during the session, please send these to me using the chat box. ARF does not own the rights, the rights to the presentation. However, the session will be excuse me, recorded. If you would like to view the recorded event, the file will be available within two weeks from today. We are extending the conversation on social media. If you would like to join us, please use hashtag ARF webcast. If you're interested in hosting a webcast of your own, please contact me at Zena at the ARF.org. We are hosting several events through the end of the year and next. If you're able to, please join us. Our final webcast of the year will take pl place next week and we'll explore the next phase of how advertising works and how it affects mobile with our very own Chris Bacon. And while this is our final webcast of 2016, don't worry, we already have a few scheduled for 2017. Take a look at our events calendar on our website for more information. And as announced a few weeks ago for our annual conference, our keynotes will feature Wendy Clark, CEO of DDB America, Raja, Ra Raja Mana, Chief Marketing Co and Communications Officer at MasterCard, and Jen Say, CMO of Levi Strauss and Company. Stay tuned in the next few weeks as we make additional announcements. If you would like to save $200 off the registration, you can do so by visiting our site now. If you're interested in any of these events or other ARF programs, you can check our website for further details or contact me at xena at the ARF.org. And without further delay, I present to you today's webcast. Our topic today is Lost in Data Translation, presented by Ken Kassar, Principal Analyst and VP at Slice Intelligence, and Matthew Davis, Vice President of Marketing at Reveal Mobile. There's no doubt today's shopping experience is dramatically evolving. Omnichannel is an undeniable shift. Consumers are engaging with brands in-store via catalogs, online websites, mobile apps, and more. In the past decade, consumers have also turned to social media to voice their opinions and connect with brands. How can, how can brands provide more seamless experiences and stay relevant across channels? Luckily, the answer is right under their nose with mobile devices, customer, excuse me, customer intelligence, and online purchasing data. Today, Ken and Matthew will walk us through the consumer journey across the omni-channel universe, both online and in-store. Ken will share some recent insights into online shopping behaviors from Black Friday and Cyber Monday, along with some specifics shopping data from Amazon. Then we'll shift gears in-store with Matthew, addressing how beacon-generated data is used to define audience segments and drive cross-device targeting and engagement, drawing on beacon insights on Walmart and Target shoppers. Ken and Matthew, I'll, take, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, if we could jump to the uh, to the next slide, uh, I will. Uh, this is Ken. Uh, I will go first, and then uh, and then Matt uh, Matthew will uh, will go second. So uh, for those of you not familiar with Slice Intelligence, I hope I hope most of you are. Um, we are the largest consumer purchase panel in the world. We have about four and a half million people uh, in the U.S. under measurement. Uh, our panelists allow us to see the receipts in their email inboxes. Uh, and uh, and grab the transaction data from those receipts. Um, uh, the uh, one of the nice things about using electronic receipts is it allows us to see purchases that happen on any digital device, whether it's a PC, Mac, smartphone, tablet, um, and uh, and the data that we get uh, is um, is pretty important data, uh, like uh, who purchased, what they purchased, where they made the purchase, which merchant they bought from, um, when they made the purchase, how much they paid, what the brands were, the product sizing, and so forth. Um, really, you, you want to think of Slice as a complement to the internal commerce da e commerce data rather um, that uh, retailers and brands have. Uh, uh, internal data will help you understand how quickly you're growing. Uh, slice data can help you contextualize that, help you understand whether you're gaining ground or uh, losing ground uh, to uh, to competitors. Uh, if we look at the next slide, uh, we um, 
Uh, we're going to start off by taking a quick look at the uh, holiday season uh, thus far. Um, the uh, and the news is uh, is pretty good. This is data that goes from the beginning of November through uh, Cyber Monday, uh, and uh, for the uh, for the holiday season to date, uh, sales are up 15% relative to 2015. Um, Black Friday sales were up 20%. Cyber Monday sales were up 10%. Um, the, uh, and, uh, the, the chart on the right, we can see daily sales tracked. Uh, the uh, orange represents 2016 or uh, 2015. The green looks at 2016. And we can see that the, uh, that the daily sales trend is really pretty similar with the exception of a, uh, of a spiky day here or there and a general elevation uh, when we look at, uh, when we look at 2016. Uh, one of the bigger trends that we uh, that we have been seeing um, is a uh, and you don't see it as much in this data, but you would see it if we were to look at data two or three years ago, um, and that's that the online holiday shopping season is starting earlier. Um, it used to really start um, uh, Black Friday, uh, and then and then Cyber Monday was a huge huge day, uh, and then sales would really kind of gradually trail off after that. Um, the uh, hitting kind of a cliff around the middle of December, right around December 15th or so. Um, the uh, What we've been seeing lately, though, is that sales have been starting earlier as online merchants are looking to get out ahead of, uh, of Black Friday as brick and mortar retailers uh, try to counter that by pushing their sales earlier and earlier. Uh, Cyber Monday is important, but it's becoming proportionally a little bit less important than it used to be. Um, and then the other really interesting thing is the data that we can't see here uh, when we look off um, with um, with uh, quicker, more reliable shipping options uh, where consumers feel comfortable that they can buy things as late as December 20th or 21st. Um, they feel that they can get it in time for the holiday, and that really has pretty significantly changed the shape of the uh, of the curve. And we'll actually talk about uh, one of those, uh, one of the things that is having a, uh, that is having a big impact, uh, Amazon Prime now uh, in, a, uh, in a few slides. Uh, on the next slide, um, the um, this is uh, this is data sort of indexed back to Black Friday of 2015, um, where we uh, that we're using in order to provide a relative comparison of different shopping days. Um, and as we can see, Cyber Monday 2016 was indeed the biggest shopping day uh, ever. Um, the um, uh, and uh, a little bit uh, higher than Black Friday. Um, one of these days, Black Friday is probably going to overtake Cyber Monday as the biggest uh, as the biggest day. But again, that elongation is making it so this concentrated period of time isn't as important as it uh, as it used to be online. Um, if we look at the next slide, um, the uh, this uh, kind of uh, casts a light most specifically on Amazon, and um, and so uh, so the, the the one thing that really kind of jumps out here is that Cyber Monday, which is that second bar in, that it's one point uh, three two times. Uh, or I'm sorry, if we look all the way out at the end, Cyber Monday 2016 is 1.5 times Black Friday of 2015. But the but the thing you can see, just look at this as a relative measure, um, is that Prime Day uh, for Amazon is is actually bigger than Cyber Monday. So Amazon successfully in the middle of July manufactured a holiday, um, and uh, the and uh, was able to uh, to get a uh, to to create a you know its biggest sales day uh, ever. Pretty impressive. Um, on the uh, on the next slide, we're looking at share, <clears throat> and um, and the first thing that will jump out is uh, how dominant uh, Amazon's share is. Uh, in 2016 and 2015, Amazon had 31% um, of sales across e-commerce. And by the way, that that's a that that includes about 300 merchants, all of the biggest merchants that we uh, that uh, that we uh, that we track at Slice and total at prop probably represents about 90 or 95 percent of total e-commerce spending. Um, so um, the uh, the other thing I should note is that our Amazon data includes both first party and third party. So if people buy from Marketplace or from Amazon proper, um, we would include those. Um, the uh, Another thing that jumps out is that Best Buy is having a very good year. Uh, Best Buy's share went from 6% to 7.4% uh, during the holiday season. Um, 
uh, we can also see that Kohl's is having a good year with share from 2.3 to 2.7. Uh, Apple is having a good year with share jumping from 0.9 to 1.5%. So there are definitely some good stories and, you know, sort of take all of that. Um, you know, in the context of it's it, it's up 15% relative to last year, which is about the growth that we've come to expect, um, uh, the year-to-year -year growth that we've come to expect in the e-commerce sector. Um, so the um, so the uh, so we we want to transition a little bit to uh, this is some consumer survey data that we had run back in August. Um, and uh, we we kind of have a hypothesis at Slice that uh, consumers are um, are increasingly coming to value convenience more than anything else. If we think back 20 years ago, um, the uh, the you know the, the thing that really propelled Amazon and the whole e-commerce space um, was uh, price and selection. You knew that you could get it cheaply. Uh, you knew that you could get whatever you wanted and then some. Um, uh, convenience was there, but it wasn't as important as it has become today. So this is uh, consumer survey data where we compelled people to uh, to choose one thing, give us one reason, uh, or if you had to select one reason uh, that you buy online, what is that? And um, and the and it's not and you know we're we're always a little bit dubious on survey data uh, at Slice, um, uh, but this is this is borne out in the behavioral purchase data that we uh, that we see as well. For example, um, when Amazon begins charging sales tax in a uh, in a given state um, the uh, our data has shown that it doesn't impact its share or its sales trajectory at all uh, people continue to purchase as they had despite the fact that they may be adding five percent or ten percent to the uh, to the price um, so uh, on the on the next slide um, the uh, and so you know, kind of keeping in mind that convenience is this thing that's becoming more and more important. Uh, Amazon is really pretty aware of that, uh, and and we've seen some pretty interesting moves lately where Amazon has been getting more and more aggressive. Surprising me, uh, who's been tracking Amazon for a while. Um, the, the we, you know we we know that uh, Amazon has bookstores open. Recently, uh, Amazon announced its Amazon Go model. Um, think of that as a convenience store without the checkout, uh, and, and it's coming in Q1 2017. We don't. A, a, a few of these things are kind of prototypes. They're they're kind of figuring out what works uh, before they uh, before they make really really big bets. Um, the uh, the picture on the right is an image of a prototype. Um, uh, drive-through op uh, drive-through model um, that is opening in um, that is opening in, uh, in, in there are two there, there are two prototypes in Seattle um, uh, the uh, and then they also have a 20 or 40 thousand square foot model in development at well as well which also combines uh, which includes inventory which also has a uh, has a pickup model um, so, uh, so a lot going on on the brick and mortar side, and again, we really do think it has a lot to do about convenience, also a lot about grocery. Grocery, we think, is a really important um, priority for uh, for Amazon. Um, but the principal focus that we want to focus on today is Prime Now. Um, uh, Prime Now is a um, is a uh, is a more traditional play for Amazon in that you buy online uh, and um, and then it's uh, it's delivered to you. Uh, it's uh, it's clearly uh, the biggest bet of, of all these different things we've talked about. A lot of those are prototypes. This is a big bet. Uh, the, it is currently in 27 markets across the uh, the United States. Um, the uh, there's a minimum order size of twenty dollars. Delivery is free to Prime members, uh, and your order comes within two hours. Uh, or if you need it within an hour, you can pay a little bit of an upcharge on that. Uh, the, so the assortment is limited, uh, just 25,000 SKUs uh, compared to the millions uh, if you were to buy from Amazon proper. So it really is a very different model um, than, um, uh, than, than, than Amazon as we, uh, as we currently know it. On the next slide, we can see the rollout of markets and the trajectory of adopters or adoption of Prime Now. Um, the uh, Manhattan was Prime Now's first market in December of 2014, um, and um, and over the course of the past two years or so, uh, we have seen uh, the addition of many markets. Again, they're up to 27. I think I haven't captured all of them here, um, but from the very uh, from just looking at year to year, September 2015 to 16, we see adoption uh, an adoption increase of four of 4.5x. Um, 
uh, over um, over uh, yeah over over that year. So uh, so a lot of people are uh, are trying it. Um, when we look at the sales numbers on the next slide, um, we can see that the sales growth has been pretty steep. Um, uh, that's if you consider 270% sales growth steep. Um, that compares July to September of 2015 with July to September of 2016. Um, we can see, we can look at December uh, of 2015 and and uh, and what a uh, what a big spike it is and um, and uh, and so it's it's going to be very we're, we're we're very interested to see what uh, what December looks like for uh, for Prime now um, but the um, <clears throat> but one of the tricks um, with this data is that it's hard to really understand kind of what organic growth looks like um, because they're rolling out so many markets. Um, is you know are we seeing real growth and adoption or are we seeing um, just it becoming available to uh, to more people? And so on the next slide, um, we look just at Manhattan uh, again, where it's been available since December of 2014. Um, and when we look, when we do that same comparison, um, we can see growth of 71%. Um, and that's to a group of people where it has been, for the most part, available uh, during that uh, during that whole time period. So good growth, probably twice um, the uh, the sales growth that Amazon proper sees, two or three times uh, the sales growth of uh, of Amazon proper. Um, and um, and so that's probably uh, that's probably good news. Um, when we look at slide 13, though, this is uh, back to some survey data um, in, in a uh, in a survey, in actually that same survey that, that we had fielded back in August that I had mentioned. Uh, we um, we asked we 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 identified 230 people of the survey sample that had uh, bought something online that was delivered the same day, and um, and so we asked about their motivation for doing so. And um, interestingly, um, a, about half of people said that they did so because they needed it right away. Um, but, uh, but about a third of people that did so did it because, well, why not? It didn't cost extra. And, um, and so, you know, the, you know, it does, you know, the, the you know, we, we, we still see, despite the growth that we've seen in Prime Now, we still see um, it is a hypothesis um, that this is going to uh, that this is going to change the game. We don't believe that the data that we've seen seen yet necessarily proves that this is going to fundamentally alter e-commerce as we know it. Now, one thing that's interesting, if we look at the next slide, um, where we're looking at the same data as we had before, but we're slicing it uh, by generation, um, we do see that depending upon who your customer is, the answers are pretty different. So, 56% um, of millennials. Um, said that when they had made that purchase, they needed it right away compared to just 26% of boomers. Um, now, whether this is a function of, uh, of millennials uh, be, because they're young um, and maybe they have less time and maybe they're less impatient or whether maybe millennials are sort of telling us what things are going to look like in the future, as is sometimes uh, the, uh, the case. Um, it's uh, it's it's going to be interesting to watch. Um, on slide 15, we jump back to some uh, behavioral data, and here we're still trying to get a sense for okay, so where is this growth coming from? Uh, it, you know, do we have you know, do we have a group of people that have become really committed to it? And uh, and 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 so here we're looking at index growth of monthly buyers and spend per month per buyer. And what we find is that the bulk of the growth is coming, even in Manhattan, a pretty established market, the bulk of the growth is coming from new people in that market buying more than it is increases in spend per buyer per month. We see a 26% lift in spend per buyer per month uh, compared to 66% in terms of the number of buyers. So the story really does seem to be mostly about new people uh, trying it. And so the question, of course, then is, okay, so if those people try it, do they like it? Do they continue? Do they repeat? And the next slide sheds some light on that. Um, here we're looking at people that have um, that have made at least one purchase uh, with Amazon Prime now. We uh, bumped out. We got rid of the people whose most recent purchase was within the most recent three months, um, and uh, and what we you know so that it's you know sort of fairish. 
And uh, what we find is that there are indeed 28% of people that just make one purchase, um, but we do have 34% of people that make six or more purchases. So there are some, are some good early signs that people, uh, that there's a group of people that are becoming committed to it. Um, but, um, but again, you know, it's, a, it's early to say that this is gangbuster is successful. Um, the next slide uh, shows us a, um, what, uh, what the assortment of products looks like that people are buying. Uh, blue shows the composition of sales by category on Amazon proper. Orange looks at the composition of sales on Prime now. And so the big takeaway from this is that grocery and gourmet food, this excludes meal delivery, by the way, uh, grocery and gourmet food account for a significant share of sales on Prime now, much more so uh, than, uh, than Amazon. Um, it really, uh, and then other categories like apparel and accessories are much, much lower on Prime now than on, uh, than on Amazon. So it really does seem to be a fairly different beast on slide 18, um, you know, the, one of the questions we often get from folks that are uh, uh, that are brands, especially um, that play in the impulse category or in the need it now kind of category, um, is that you know they, they've they've wondered whether there really is uh, how relevant e-commerce is to them, um, and um, and so you know the, the sometimes two uh, two days or three days just isn't enough. When we look at the cough and cold category and the proportion of sales across Amazon versus Prime Now, um, we see that people are much much more likely to buy in cough and cold. So think over over counter uh, over the counter. Uh, when we look at candy and chocolate, they're three and a half times more likely to buy uh, to buy candy and chocolate. Um, uh, other categories, condoms, we see less of a lift. So maybe sometimes two hours isn't even enough. Um, but uh, but definitely, you know, th there there is a change in the types of things that people will buy when they have the ability to get it now. But uh, but before we slip uh, flip to the next slide, um, just guess kind of in your mind um, what percent of sales you think um, in Manhattan, right, a mature market uh, for uh, for Amazon uh, the um, for Amazon Prime now. Uh, w what percent of sales would be Prime now, where you can get it free within two hours if you're a Prime member uh, versus Amazon proper? And when we look at the next slide, which we can flip to now, um, the pie chart on the right shows Manhattan, and indeed it's only uh, two percent of Amazon sales are coming through Prime now in Manhattan. Ninety-eight percent are going through Amazon proper. When we look at it nationally, that's the chart on the left. Only one percent of sales are coming through Prime now. Um, the uh, so there obviously you know the, uh, the 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 broader selection that's available um, may be a a key driver here. Um, but the uh, but but. But it's you know again the jury is still out on whether um, this is uh, fun whether this is yet fundamentally changing the game. Um, on the next slide, and uh, my last data slide, um, we just look at the demographics and um, at, at where we're comparing uh, Amazon Proper versus Amazon Prime Now. Blue is Amazon Proper, orange is Prime Now. Um, we don't see much of a story when we look at household income, but with gender, we see that there's a much heavier skew toward males. And there's a much heavier skew, especially toward 25 to 34, which kind of syncs with that need it now sense that we had picked up from the uh, survey data that we had looked uh, that we had looked at a few slides ago. So, very very interesting stuff. We think that it makes sense for everybody, whether you're a brand, whether you're a retailer, to keep a very close eye on this to uh, to uh, to understand whether you need to start making bets, whether it's collaborating with Amazon or whether it's competing with Amazon. So, just my closing thoughts before I hand it over to uh, to Matthew. Um, <clears throat> so we are so clearly we're seeing a continued shift that is not slowing down from offline to online during the holidays as well as during the rest of the year. Um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, this idea that convenience is really the principal reason that consumers are buying online today, uh, we think is a really, really critical shift. Um, you know, the, you know, the, to kill yourself as a merchant, um, trying to offer the lowest price um, uh, may not be the right thing to do if it comes at the expense of convenience, whether it's getting things to consumers more quickly or finding other ways to deliver convenience. Um, clearly, Amazon's ambition is not limited to online anymore, um, uh, and, uh, and we're going to be watching very closely some of these new formats and how they, uh, how they work out. Um, the uh, uh, Prime Now is clearly the newest and biggest threat to brick and mortar. Um, again, we don't yet know how 
uh, how big of a deal it's going to be. But we do know that that that, that the ability uh, to get products within the same day certainly opens up substantial impulse opportunities within categories where internet had become a bit less relevant. So that's what I had. Uh, let me uh, pass the uh, the baton over to uh, to Matthew now, and then we'll have questions at the end if anybody has questions on uh, on my part. Wonderful, thank you, kid. So let's jump right into the hidden secrets of beacon data. And we think about data being lost in translation. When we are thinking about beacons, the majority of the use cases you hear today are, are focused on real-time alerts, proximity-based notifications. You walk into a place and you get an alert and you got the alert because the app on your phone detected your beacon. Well, we think about beacons very, very differently uh, and we use them to help facilitate data. Uh, and I think that's where we start to see a lot of really interesting things happening. If you didn't know, beacons are absolutely everywhere. This is a snapshot of many of the beacons that we have been able to detect and place on a map across the United States. You can peruse that list at your leisure at thebeaconmap.com. And as we go through this, I'll explain how we're doing this and a little bit more about what we do so that it fits in organically into the whole picture here. The next slide. In case you didn't know, the Super Fast Beacon 101, they are just these little Bluetooth radios. Uh, retailers, restaurants have fallen in love with them. All they do is just broadcast out a Bluetooth signal. That's all they do. They don't receive data, they don't store data, uh, and an app on the phone can detect it. They're really small uh, and affordable devices. They can last a couple years unless you have the ones like the one on the right that plug into a USB port. As you saw on the map, they're in hundreds of thousands of locations, uh, including some of the top brands that are out there. Next slide. And this is a slide that we have uh, borrowed from our friends at Unicast. Uh, they made it nice and tidy for us, uh, and the world is getting censored up. So ABI Research uh, estimates there are going to be 500 million beacons deployed uh, in the next five years. That is a ton of beacons. Uh, you've got 50% of the, oh, there we go, 50% of the top 100 US retailers out there already using beacons today. And then there are a lot of companies like us and certainly of all various different flavors that are building some sort of beacon or proximity or beacon analysis solution out there today. Next slide. So the, where we fit into this whole picture is we have technology that sits inside of a few hundred mobile apps today across the US, uh, some very high usage apps, and we figure out where these beacons are uh, on a map, uh, and then, next slide, we turn all of that into meaningful audience data. So when we are able to figure out where a beacon lives, we can say, yes, this beacon is actually at an airport, uh, it's at a Dunkin' Donuts, uh, it's at Fenway Park. And so now, once we do that, anytime we see a device bumping into uh, those beacons, we can say, yes, this person is a business traveler, or yes, this person has been to the Dunkin' Donuts quite a few times in the last day, and they're, they're a donut enthusiast. Next slide. And so the mantra you often hear, and to one to which we uh, agree as well, is that location is going to be the next cookie. But location data has some issues. Next slide. It, it needs help. That's basically what it boils down to. So a company called ThinkNear, they analyze uh, all of the billions and billions, if not trillions, of ad requests coming through the bid stream for latitude longitude data to see how accurate it is. And every quarter they put the study out, and every quarter it's pretty much the same data. Somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of all the lo location requests that they see are accurate to within about a football field. Now, this is still really valuable data, and we use this data too. Uh, it's definitely one of uh, a data source that we take advantage of. But it just means it's good enough to say that somebody's at a shopping mall. It's not good enough to say that somebody's at the Starbucks in the shopping mall. It also means that 68% of the time, your, your data is likely less accurate than that. And so then how Reveal Mobile thinks about this is, well, we're listening to all these beacons that are out there. And because these are little Bluetooth radios that broadcast a very finite signal, and you have to usually be within 30 meters of the thing to detect it, if not closer, the accuracy uh, on this beacon generated location data is drastically improved. Very, very uh, valuable data. Next slide. Uh, 
So if you take a step back to that uh, forecast that you see from ABI research and that beacons are going to grow to 500 million deployed across the globe, what we really think about this in terms of the amount of data that's going to generate is that you're essentially cookieing the physical world. If every type of location that you go into that you can buy or sell something has a beacon installed, it's essentially the physical equivalent of a digital tracking pixel. Uh, so it's a really, really fascinating space to be in right now. Next slide. So let's jump right into the hidden secrets of beacon data that we're seeing. The way that we source the data today, we are an SDK, sits inside 400 plus apps. We listen for two primary Bluetooth signals. The iBeacon uh, signal is the one that uh, Apple puts out. And that's their standard for Bluetooth detection. Eddie Stone is Google's. We also partner with uh, quite a few uh, Beacon companies uh, and other data companies who give us their data and say, please help us make sense of this Beacon data, turn it into audience data for us. And that's ultimately what we do. We turn the location data that comes out of uh, mobile devices into audience data that's valuable for uh, customer retention, customer acquisition, for optimizing ad buying behavior, for measuring attribution. You will see in this data that some places are more represented than others, and that's because when you put beacons in, you increase the amount of data that you are able to collect and the, increase the amount of devices you're able to, to collect. The beacon detection can happen in the background without the app even being open. So that increases the amount of devices you'll see. We did look over 30 day period for this study or for these studies. And as we drill down into this food and dining category, uh, we'll, we're looking at a total of uh, 3.1 million devices. Next slide. We start first at the top with which standard has the most adoption. Uh, Eddie Stone is certainly making a big marketing splash, at, le at least in these uh, nerdy beacon uh, circles that we follow. Uh, but out in the market today, the majority of beacon signals we're detecting are still iBeacon. When we look at which operating systems detect the most beacon, very heavily slanted towards Android uh, versus iOS, and that's because uh, Android will let you detect any beacon out there. Uh, Apple, on the other hand, limits you to only be able to look for 20 of the top level beacon identifiers out there. So you have a limited field of view. And so therefore you see more uh, Android devices detecting beacons. Next slide. We also looked at which categories deploy the most beacons. And for the most part, the data here is what we see in the press that uh, shopping, restaurants, retail account for all the, well, the vast majority of beacons that we're seeing deployed. Uh, that's the red line there. The yellow orangish line is how many devices we see bumping into those beacons. So pretty a normal uh, spread there across shopping and uh, restaurants. Uh, travel, we see a lot of beacons being deployed, uh, but minimal uh, activity on. That's because how not everybody goes to the airport as frequently as you may go to the gym over there in the health and fitness category. Next slide. When we drill down into food and dining, we looked at just over 7,200 beacons that were located inside just over 2,300 unique locations. And it's not the 80-20 rule, but we saw that the top 100 locations accounted for just about 55% of all the beacons deployed. When we look where we're actually seeing the activity uh, for devices bumping into beacons, the majority here is in restaurants. They're definitely the ones who are adopting uh, beacon technology more often. And the reason they might do that is you walk in, uh, you're notified of an alert, some sort of deal that hey, this is on special today, or perhaps it's notifying the back that your order is ready if you've placed that order online. Next slide. When we look at the actual count of beacons that we're seeing at particular locations, you guys can read this for yourself. Uh, you can certainly see who's adopting them more so than others. And to be clear here, this does not mean Subway has deployed exactly 960 beacons. Uh, this means that these are the amount of beacons that we have been able to detect at Subway locations. They may have deployed 3,000, but these are the only the ones that we've been able to uh, figure out where they are from ourselves. Next slide.
We also wanted to measure the other locations that they visit. So this food and dining audience, where else do they go? Lo and behold, most people also shop for groceries. They also do other types of shopping behaviors right here. Next slide. So now let's drill down specifically into data that we saw across both Target and Walmart locations. So when we go to the next slide here, we'll actually see the coverage of beacons that we were able to detect at uh, Target locations. So 450 locations is where we saw beacons, about 25% market share. Uh, the next slide shows the Walmart data where we have been able to detect beacons at approximately 319 locations or about 6% market share of their total 5,300 locations. So what type of data do we actually see? Next slide. What we found is that people go to Walmart much more frequently than they go to Target. So average visits per device. Uh, so we, we would see a device on average uh, 6.2 times a month at Walmart versus 1.8 at Target. We do see devices visiting both Target and Walmart. That's that little Venn diagram down there towards the bottom. We also see that Target shoppers skew more heavily towards having an iPhone, uh, with Walmart shoppers skewing more heavily towards having an Android phone. Next slide. If that slide has advanced, there, there we go. Okay, I can see it. Maybe there may be a lag here between uh, what's happening on the internet and what I see on my screen, so forgive me. We do also see for income ranges, target skews slightly higher. And then on the next slide, we'll see home values uh, for target and Walmart shoppers, which also skews higher. Uh, and the way that we actually source this data, so over time, we are able to determine where a device actually lives. And once you have a home location, uh, uh, we can append third-party data on top of it. In this case, it's U.S. Census data that provides things like income, home values, uh, home ownership status, education ranges, are they parents, are they married? Uh, and this is obviously certainly valuable data to understanding more about your mobile audience. Next slide. When we look at where else target visitors shop, I think the thing that was most surprising to us here was that Walmart, uh, or excuse me, Target shoppers, the next place they visited most frequently was Walmart. We also do, uh, do see Starbucks represented uh, pretty strongly here, and uh, one hypothesis here is that many Target locations do have Starbucks inside, and so we're picking up uh, additional devices there. As we move to the next slide, and we see where else do Walmart shoppers visit, they also go to Target. Uh, that's down there, number five on the list, though, so as with not as great a frequency as the other way around. Again, we also see Subway and McDonald's uh, represented highly here. This could uh, potentially be due to the fact that many Walmarts do have Subways and McDonald's inside. And on the next side, we'll, uh, excuse me, on the next slide, we'll show many of these stacked next together here. So you can see the propensity of Target shoppers to hit the Starbucks more often with Walmart shoppers visiting Subway and McDonald's more frequently. Next slide. All right, a few more fun beacon data uh, analyses to share here. So on the next slide, uh, we participated in a panel at the uh, at South by Southwest for the Location-Based Marketing Association uh, back in March. And we thought it would be fun to see what kind of beacon activity do we see at South by Southwest. So over the period of the conference, we saw just over 1,600 beacons detected uh, from 56 different, basically, parent or top level identifiers of beacons. That could be 56 different companies, 56 different marketing firms. Um, there's a lot of beacons there, I think, is the takeaway. The image on the left is of downtown Austin. And these are not actually locations of beacon. These, these are the locations of the devices that are bumping into the beacons at, uh, during the show. The image on the right there shows uh, East 6th Street, that main thoroughfare through downtown Austin where all the action is. So it's a nice visual representation of what happens with devices and where they are when they're bumping into beacons. On the next slide, uh, we really drilled into the carrier retail locations here. And the first thing that jumps out is like, oh my gosh, why the heck does Verizon show so much more data here? 
And what's going on is that Verizon has a nationwide network of beacons installed in their retail locations. And it gets back to that point that if you put beacons in, you generate a lot more data. So any mobile analytics company that's saying, hey, we can tell you who visits particular locations. Well, if you put beacons in locations or you're able to measure the devices bumping into those beacons at those locations, you can drastically improve by magnitudes of two, three, and four the amount of audience data that you are able to collect. So from the retailer brand perspective, if you're looking to understand who that audience is that's walking through the door uh, and then where else they are going to shop, like beacons can play a pretty interesting, uh, uh, an interesting role there. Next slide. So to, to wrap it all up here, so there are a lot of beacons out there and they're coming. And if you think about the use cases for them, still I think what you read about mostly is this real-time notification of a beacon. And that's really scratching the surface of the value, this, this kind of stereotypical iceberg metaphor, where the real value of data or of beacons is going to emerge uh, in this data, and that's what we're hoping does not get lost in translation here. So there are lots of use cases for beacons beyond just push. It's learning more about who your audience is, where else they shop, being able to measure um, more foot traffic by putting beacons in. And ultimately what we do is then turning all of that location data into audience data. That's it for my piece. All right, everyone. Um, now we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. And I will begin. Ken and Matthew, are you both unmuted? Uh, yes, I think so. All right, great. <clears throat> so first question, how are traditional retailers responding to Amazon's moves? Um, I guess that's me. Um, the uh, so. Yeah, so traditional retailers, think about Walmart and Target, uh, have, um, you know, are obviously very aware of uh, Amazon and they all see uh, Amazon as the, as the biggest threat to their, you know, to their future growth and existence and all that. Um, the uh, Walmart in particular has made some pretty aggressive moves um, uh, the, uh, uh, recently within the past year or so. Um, they have, uh, first of all, they, they paid three point something billion dollars for Jet.com um, with the hope that uh, Jet and its leader, Mark Laurie, um, uh, uh, have, uh, have figured out how to, uh, how to take Amazon on. Um, they have also rolled out uh, Amazon Grocery, uh, which is a buy online, pick up in store, click and carry type operation out. Uh, and I believe that it's going to be in something like a thousand stores um, uh, pretty uh, pretty shortly. Um, and the uh, and the early results on that have uh, have looked pretty good. Um, so the uh, so of course you know the but but you know with all of the brick and mortar moves that Amazon is making, um, you know the it it, it it's. I, I, my guess is that it's going to probably accelerate the concerns amongst, amongst brick and mortar retailers um, uh, as to uh, as to as to how quickly they need to move, how big they need to bet uh, in order to counter uh, uh, you know Amazon showing up increasingly in their own backyards. I'll add a little bit there too. So from our from the beacon industry that we live in here, we do see. Uh, the physical retailers making more of an effort to bring the online into the offline. Uh, or into the actual store so that if you are standing in front of an aisle, um, uh, you can use beacons or indoor navigation to help you find your way. You can use those to serve you relevant content or product information when you're standing in front of those items, whether that be beacons or Wi-Fi or uh, RFID tags. There's certainly a lot of opportunity there to merge the online experience while you're standing there in the store. Okay, next question. How is Prime now different from failed ventures in the past, like Cosma and Urban Fetch? Um, yeah, so that's a uh, that is a, a big question. So for those of you um, that uh, that weren't um, uh, paying attention uh, to the space back in the late '90s, early '00s, um, there uh, there were a few businesses that were similar to Amazon. Uh, or to Amazon Prime now, uh, where they had a relatively limited assortment uh, that get it to consumers pretty quickly, um, and those guys all failed uh, after uh, after lots and lots of investment. And ironically, Amazon was an early investor in uh, Cosmo. 
Um, the you know it's you know I, I the the it's not obvious um, that today's environment is uh, well well no what what is obvious is that today's environment is fundamentally different. We have many more people that are buying online. Um, we have many people, particularly in urban areas, that um, that you know where a lot of their spending is uh, is taking place online, and so there's more. Um, the, you know, there there's more general appetite and audience uh, for this sort of thing today, um, but the uh, but the costs are certainly higher. Um, it's uh, you know to have to localize inventory and get it to consumers much more quickly without the benefit of a third party uh, third party shippers like UPS um, is uh, is going to be tricky. You know, I, I um, yeah, it's I you know I think that it's a much better landscape today than it was then, but I would say that there is still risk. Um, that the uh, that this may that the Prime now could be a little too much, a little too early. Um, but Amazon, Amazon has kind of proven us wrong many times in the past, uh, and uh, has uh, just by sheer force of will um, and uh, you know some patience, a willingness to uh, to kind of take losses, uh, has uh, has managed to change how we how we do things. Okay, what should brands be doing given Amazon's growing dominance? Um, yeah, so, so we tell, uh, we tell clients that, um, that they, uh, that, that they really need to have kind of a two part strategy. Uh, one part is working with Amazon, uh, and figuring out because Amazon has gotten complex. It's not just Amazon anymore. There's Amazon, there's prime. Now there's Amazon fresh. Uh, there's, uh, we have brick and mortar offerings and, um, and, uh, and then even within Amazon proper, we have offerings like Amazon pantry and, uh, and prime. And, and so there, 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 there are a lot of different things you need to know about Amazon. And so, you know, one thing we tell clients is that they've got to be really, really smart. They have to understand all the different wrinkles of Amazon's business and figure out which parts are highly relevant to them, um, and make decisions as to which parts aren't, um, and um, but the other piece is that we do believe that uh, or we, we, we do tell our, our brand clients that in addition to figuring out how to work effectively with Amazon because of its sizable share, um, they do need to think about making investments in order to cultivate competitors. Um, and um, and whether that means subsidization of shipping and handling costs um, uh, or, 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 or doing other things that retailers may need in order to stay competitive with Amazon, uh, we do believe that it's in brand's best interest to have a robust array of retailers uh, to uh, to work through. Okay, it looks like that's all we have for questions. Um, Matthew and Ken, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to share before we close? Uh, none for me. I'm great. Thanks for hosting today. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to present your work uh, with our webcast crowd. Um, and also thank you to everybody who was able to join us. I hope you all join us for our next and final webcast of 2016 next week. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.